going to take a look at uh, Victory Games 1809. This is in the Zucker family series, whatever. I think this one was not released previously under OSG, under any name or anything. Uh, first thing you notice, and we're going to have trouble with this one, I can tell you right off the bat, but first thing you notice, this is a long game. I don't mean necessarily it takes a long time. It's got a fair number of turns, and if you're familiar with the Zucker games, yeah, those turns can take a little bit of time each, but sometimes they're not too bad. Uh, probably anywhere between 10 minutes and a half hour for normal play. I probably will be paralyzed and sitting here and, and running away and hiding from it at times. <laughs> um, my history with this game has been sort of so-so, which is to say it, uh, yeah, it is a big game. <laughs> um, it very much excited me to play a Napoleonic game and I, this was either my first or second of the Zucker games. Probably second, I think, Struggle of Nations was my first. And it had a few things. One, it was kind of difficult to, uh, to get used to this style of game. Uh, so you might have trouble with the uh, uh, great campaigns of the American Civil War. I had trouble with the Zucker games. And honestly, I don't think that trouble has really cleared up on anything except Napoleon at Bay, which I find particularly clean, uh, and I come back to them after playing that and think, ooh, I'll be able to handle, you know, now that I get the basic concepts. But I'm not so sure. Uh, that one has victory conditions that make sense to me, and the rules are fairly clean. Let's take a look at what we got on the map. Uh, force displays for both the French and the Austrians. This covers... Uh, uh, the 1809 campaign, um, but it, this was some of the hardest fighting that Napoleon had done, in fact, the hardest fighting probably uh, to date, and his reaction to Wagram, which was, you know, sort of the culminating battle in this, uh, was that, geez, you know, the Austrians know how to fight. <laughs> um, the game comes with, I think, four different scenario choices. Wagram being the smallest one, it starts down here. Essling, they all end at the same point. Essling giving you, you know, a start where the action's really getting heavy. This is the historical campaign. There's an early start alternate campaign that can also be played. There are no little battle scenarios or anything like that. Wagram's probably the closest you get to that. There's a lot going on in it. Um, we're going to play the historical. I don't think I've ever played any other scenario. Uh, yep, I need a six-sided dice. Okay, I think I knew that. Uh, we'll get that cleared up a little later. Um, all right, let's take a look at some of the pieces. Find a general, and I gotta check what the different things are. Okay, so I'll take Davu here because he's close by. The first number is the initiative, and that's your chance of that general doing something if you don't expend orders on him. That has sort of perverse effects, which is to say that leaders who have high initiatives are more likely to fail to do what they need to do um, because you're unlikely to spend for them. So Napoleon Davu, there's a good chance that they can just screw you completely. The second number is how many subordinate things they can have on under their control. So if we take a look at Davu here, he's allowed nine subordinate points. Well, um, for units, the subordination is, I believe, the leftmost number. So this infantry costs one, two, three, and a half. Now, in addition to having actual units, and their strength is represented in a little box, in addition to having actual units on the board, you can also, or on your, 
uh, leader sheet. You can also have subordinate commanders. Uh, shit, things got bumped. That's probably here. I can look it up, but now I won't. Um, so, for example, if Davu wanted Napoleon under him, he would pay the subordination cost for Napoleon, which is four. Um, you probably don't want to do that just because you'd feel really icky putting Napoleon under Davu. Uh, you put Davu under Napoleon, but you kind of want them, they're both very good leaders. You kind of want them each commanding their own sort of force. Um, what else do we have? Uh, we have supply centers uh, or supply endpoints. These are where you have to trace your supply to your administrative center. And the administrative center, the further it gets away from the supply center, and if you've seen the other Zucker games I've covered, you probably have seen this, the further it gets from the supply center, the less command points you get. Um, but the uh, command center has to be within a certain range of your units to give them any commands at all, which is an issue. Also, not also. I thought the distance affected your attrition, which would have maybe changed some of my decisions, but it doesn't. We got some pontoon bridges. I don't know why these are here when there's a major road going over that space. Maybe we'll find out as we read the rules. Um, I've read the rules probably a couple of weeks ago and didn't feel like I really grasped them any more than I usually do, which is to say I get the basics of the Zucker stuff. I don't ever seem to absorb all the minutia very well. Um, anything else here? Yeah, we got some tracks and such not. And we got these suckers, which we'll be using a lot. Those suckers are when you fight battles, if you choose one of these secretly, and if you end up losing the battle, that determines what happens. If you picked a pursuit chip, you run away and the winner gets to pursue you. If you picked a uh, pitched battle and you stood, the, play, the attacker switches and the other player becomes the attacker. And we saw this in uh, Napoleon at Bay as well. There's a limitation on how many times you can pick a pitched battle with or without effect as far as I can know. Over here we got some tracks. Here's where you keep your admin points. This is where replacement points are going to be. Those are, you can fill up your units using those if they're in dispatch distance. We have a little track to keep track of the weather for the turn. This is the victory conditions for the game, the Vienna morale track. If you can boot the morale off one side or the other of the track, the game's over and it's a major victory. Turn record track, obviously. Yeah. I'm gonna need breaks in this, so maybe I should start taking them fast and furious. Uh, let's take a look at some of the units a little bit because they have different numbers on them. Okay. Um, the first number is the subordination cost. <laughs> this is not the same order as on the leaders. That can cause some difficulty in remembering. The middle number is the movement point allowance of the unit. And the final number on the bottom is how many strength points it can hold. So this is six, it's sitting on the six box, it's full up. This number is the cadre level. Damned if I remember what that is. Uh, Maybe an optional rule. I know I read about it. It's one of the specials in this. We have different types of symbols in here. Infantry, cav, light cav, and artillery. And those 
affect the movement points and the attrition to some extent. Um, some units, for example this, have a dot instead of their subordination cost. What that means is he's part of this unit. Okay, So there's a cav component and an infantry component and you pay the cost of the unit that has a cost and you get both those components under your leader. Oh, as with all these Zucker games, you can't uh, stack your leaders. Like you can't have a really deep hierarchy. Um, one commander can command sub subordinates. Subordinates are not allowed to command further subordinates, so you can't get in for that stack. So like that. There's generic leaders, these major generals. Um, the infantry major general can basically carry one infantry unit and one cavalry unit. He's got a one and a half command span, and that's pretty much what it means. There may be some small infantry units that are half point, what there are, I don't know. Um, and a cav major general is allowed to essentially haul around two cav pieces. You can assign cav to an infantry major general, you can't assign infantry to a cavalry major general. The cav major generals have a higher initiative, so they're more capable of doing things. <laughs> infantry major generals have a zero initiative. They essentially can only do things if you pay. All righty. Uh, occupation markers. There are none. <laughs> yeah. You can use uh, other game markers. There are a number of game markers in play. These trestle bridges to indicate bridges that have been built. Uh, damage markers, which indicate that the bridge is damaged. Redoubts for defensive purposes. Um, extended formation, which is a combat penalty, but an attrition bonus. Administrative march, if you remember in uh, Napoleon at Bay, there are essentially rules where you can spend a command point to move something over more than one turn. You only allowed one of these at any given time for each of the sides. Some of the units are big, and we had an example of that somewhere here. When this holds 11 strength points, well, it's got a plus 10 side on it. The others are blank on the other side. There are some available units to add to the number of units you have on the board. You're able to switch force uh, strength points around to some extent. So you can create other units if you want to. I don't usually feel myself in that much need. You don't end up filling up all your units, but if you have some task and you need a unit for it, you get some excess. Right then. Uh, there are some weird things with pieces. So for example, the Austrian General Fremont I seem to be missing Major General H. Uh, I may have lost him. I don't know. Or maybe he's kicking somewhere. Yeah, there he is. Okay. He's an assigned reinforcement. Um, yeah, he's actually the assigned reinforcement for Vienna. Uh, if the French get close to Vienna, he comes in. That's why he's not there. But the uh, leader Fremont is not listed in most of the scenarios, maybe not in any of them. Uh, he's listed in the Wagram scenario as unavailable. In all the other scenarios, there's no mention of him either under reinforcements or otherwise. I am bringing him in as part of the Pressburg reinforcements because that's when his unit shows up. And then he becomes, I don't know, just an available leader without a command at that point that you can move around and use. I do have some errata in, written into here. I don't know where I got it from. Okay. Base sequence of play. Maybe we won't go too deep into the rules here because 
I'm struggling. Uh, okay, you start off with the administrative phase. You designate which is your active supply source. Um, you have the right, if your center of operations is active, to disband it, and it'll come back on the board a little later. You're gonna get new points on your administrative point pool, and we've seen all this before. You count the number of roads, major roads, from the supply source to the center of operations. You roll a die, and you get that many points. Therefore, you want your center of operations, you, you want your administrative center to be close to your, uh, to your uh, supply source. The French start off with that very easily here. But the problem is, of course, your center of operations has to be near the front, too. The Austrians, not so close. That's their nearest supply source. You can say, wow, the French are going to have a lot of trouble as the game goes on, aren't they? Yeah, except that eventually they are able to turn something over here into a supply source. And I don't see it. That's an Austrian one. That's where they fall back to. Uh, huh. Is it Passau? Yeah. Okay. So they can move their, their center of operations up to Passau. The only, or their supply source up to Passau. But they have to maintain a line going back of cities that are under their control or not under somebody else's control. They still have a long way. <laughs> and that's gonna be painful, no doubt. Okay. Oh yeah, we didn't talk about lots and lots of charts and tables in this. Um, you got movement costs. You got, I don't know why I say Austrian here when they've got Austrian there. And I don't know why they're different. Um, a number of different reminders here, all very helpful. The French have an equivalent chart, and then each side has its scenario chart, which has additional summary, and then the setup and reinforcements. <clears throat> this does not contain all of the setup instructions. There's about a small paragraph on each of these scenarios. Um, that is necessary in the rule book itself. Okay, so anyway, where were we? So you get your new admin points, you get any replacement points added to your track, and then you're allowed to organize. Um, you can shift strength point and markers between the commanders and leaders in the hex, and um, <laughs> we forgot the weather determination, you make a die roll for the weather. Uh, and at the same time, you can create major general markers. Um, you can add replacement points. And you can bring new counters for, to hold strength points. Okay, your march phase. First, you do a dispatch march segment. You have to be in range of your center of operations. And you pay. Um, you move those units, and you kind of want to tilt them or something to indicate that they've moved. and you take attrition as they move, or at the end of their movement. Uh, then any units you haven't moved yet, you can roll for initiative for, and then any, and likewise you roll for attrition, and then you hit the attrition resolution segment, any forces that haven't moved at all have to check for attrition there. Then you're allowed to, um, well you must, consolidate all, for all units in a hex under one commander. Um, you're allowed to move, activate, or reconstitute your friendly center of operations, which will, if you're moving it, it'll deactivate it. Um, and then you can attempt to do things to bridges. Okay, then the other player can do reaction marches, which I believe require an initiative roll. They consolidate their forces, and any battles 
that are set up, which is basically adjacency, have to be fought. Then both players get to consolidate their forces after the battle. And then the second player gets the same kind of sequence. Okay, so far doesn't sound too complicated. It sounds very much like the Napoleon at Bay type system. And I don't think it is more complicated, but <laughs> it hurts me more. Um, Vienna morale, remember this is how you win the game, um, moves when a leader with subordination allowance of six is eliminated. Uh, if a critical battle happens, if the French hit Regensburg, 0815. Yeah, that's not, uh, that doesn't sound too hard. Okay, so Regensburg is an important location. It shifts the morale when it falls to either side, I believe. Uh, if the French occupy Vienna and there's no Austrian forces there, that's worth a morale point, no more. Um, and if the French are within seven hexes of Vienna, that's worth a morale point. Both of these happen only once per game. And they can't, they're the ones that cannot be reversed. That happens, that hurts Austrian morale, Viennese morale, no matter what. Um, if the, uh, yeah, Regensburg is important for the Austrians too. Whoever has it gets a bonus. If Charles, with at least 20 strength points, exits the map at Hamau, um, and the morale marker is already in the plus three box, this wins them the game. It moves it the extra thing, and I don't know where. Hamau's over here. So if the Austrians can push the French completely back, <laughs> with the battle you know, set up, or the, or the campaign set up down here, and this much map, you gotta imagine the French are going to be able to make some ground here. If not, we got a problem. However, it's really, really unlikely that you can get to that plus three box because it doesn't actually exist. No, it does. Um, basically, you have to take Regensburg and you have to win a major battle or beat up, you know, uh, one of the good generals. Is that important here? Yeah. Um, so, like, if you beat up Napoleon or Davout or whatever, I don't think there are any others. <sighs> so, conceivably, the Austrians could win this very early, but it's highly unlikely they're not. They're not favored down there. <laughs> okay. As soon as the Viennese marker uh, moves past the plus or minus three box, the game ends in a decisive victory. If the whole scenario plays and the marker's either positive or negative, that side wins and you can kind of look at how far over the morale is as how well they won. Of course, you could also look at military, you know, effects throughout the game if you want to come up with other reasons. We didn't talk about this. Remember Davu had a little star on him? That means he's better at battle. Uh, and that's attack or defense. And it also means he suffers less attrition. Leaders are eliminated um, if they're alone in the hex with a, the enemy, which happens also if uh, all the strength points in a battle are removed from that leader. And there's, I believe, some rules to prevent that from like, I, I, I believe the way it's set up, you have enough control that that doesn't kind of happen by accident. Basically your whole force is wiped out if that happens. Um, I seem to remember special rules about major generals. Maybe not here. They're an unlimited force, uh, the number of major generals. All right. Uh, let me pause a little bit. I need a break. One of the major concepts here is the definition of a force. 
in general you have one force in a hex. Um, you define a force in order to move, uh, attack, counterattack, retreat, pursue, and during consolidation. There are also cases where you define a force in more than one hex. And you basically have to follow the subordination limitations. Multi-hex forces, uh, you can command adjacent forces that are not separated from your hex by an unbridged primary river hex. If a force somehow is illegal, it Only the commander of that force can march, receive replacements, reorganize, participate in battle. Uh, they mean the commander and his actual defined subordinates to some extent. Yeah. Oh, the illegal force commander is not charged with the subordination cost of the leaders on his track, but that includes subordinate leaders. So. Um, they participate in attrition resolution. Their strength points are counted for defining zone of control and for defense, but they're not allowed to march off together. They're not allowed to attack. If the commander leaves, then a new force gets defined there and there's a new commander in place. It may or may not end up in illegal stack. We talked a little bit about this. You're allowed to transfer uh, forces. There's limitations on illegal forces. They can. We'll try to avoid illegal forces. Uh, same thing, replacement points can be given uh, if you're in dispatch distance for the most part. Weather is just a die roll. The effects. Charts. The effects are going to be on the resistance table, which affects how easily you get away from the enemy. And that can be in pursuit or just normal movement. Um, what else does it affect? Attrition is also affected by it, if I can find it. There it is. And rain and mud add one to the attrition. <coughs> Communications, we've already kind of covered some of this. I uh, forgot about this one. When Budweis, which is that hex up there, is first run through by the French, the Austrians lose all their um, command points. Dispatch distance is different for the two nations. The Austrians have 26 movement points, French 18. Um, you can get admin points to help you with it. Uh, attrition. And the pool only increases when the center of operations is active, i.e. not off board, not moving. Marching. Forces are allowed to march. Uh, they expend movement points, as you would expect. Uh, if it's a dispatch march, you define the force, you pay the cost, and you're allowed to move up to your movement point allowance of the strength points involved. An extended march is following a dispatch march. You uh, spend an extra admin point and you get four extra movement points. And then uh, whichever one you did, at the end of that, you roll on the attrition table. Now what's ugly about this is the attrition table is kind of complicated. Look at the number of APs you have, which will be zero if you're not in dispatch distance. 
the size of the force, not counting artillery and I think guards, but artillery count when the weather's bad or something. Um, and then how many movement points you moved compared to a die roll, which has modifiers. And that'll give you how many strength points you lose in that force. So big forces, moving large distances, being uh, low on AP or outside of dispatch distance, these things all cause you to take higher attrition. Okay, initiative march works similarly, except you do not uh, dispatch march. And you roll a die, and if you get less than or equal to your initiative rating, you're allowed to move, and you'll take attrition. There's a good, there's some chance that you will be outside of dispatch distance when you do this, which means you'll be using the zero to three AP table. Reaction marches. Okay, remember there's a phase after the phasing player moves, but before combat's resolved, where the non-phasing player is allowed to reaction march. You roll a die. Compared to initiative, if you succeed, you're allowed to do a reaction march. However, even if you fail, you're going to take attrition. Now, the attrition will have a plus four added to the die roll, which increases your attrition significantly. Um, you can enter an enemy-controlled hex only if another friendly force already occupies that hex. Now, in general, you're not going to want to do reaction movement in this game because of some of the penalties. Although, like in Napoleon at Bay, those may cancel out. So, you know, let's say I'm, I've got a, a reasonable size force, say 8 to 10 strength points, and I've got all the APs I need in the world. Well... As long as I move two to three movement points or less, I'm safe. In fact, it looks to me, right? I think, I don't know, this is a pain to read. But once I get to the four to five movement points, there's some chance that I might get killed. Um, of course, on the... I think even five, uh, four to five is safe because an 11 will only happen if it's like a reaction march and there are problems like bad weather. So that all works out that way. Uh, you can drop forces off as you're moving, but they still count towards your attrition. If you move next to an enemy force, you can try to push it out of the way. You announce the number of strength points in your marching force, and the enemy reveals how many strength points they have in the target. If the marching force is at least seven times the enemy hex, the enemy falls back two hexes. If it's less than that, the marching force has to end its march, and it's going to have to make an attack, and I believe that attack has a penalty to it. This is not something you want to use very often, like if you're unsure of what you're facing. Seven times is a lot. Unemployed leaders don't have troops. Um, they have a movement allowance of nine as though they're like cavalry. You don't have to spend admin points to move them. You don't have to roll for initiative. Uh, the center of operations itself, you're allowed to move this up to 10 hexes, only on major road hex, hex sides. Um, doesn't cost you any admin points. However, well, it will flip over and not be gaining any and not be serving as a center of operations. It can also move instead uh, along the Danube, but only eastward. It must start adjacent to the Danube. It can then travel any distance east along the river and plop off anywhere along the Danube on a major road. Uh, it cannot move by road in the same segment it travels by river. Okay, I'm going to need to switch batteries, and then we'll get to the attrition, but I think 
I covered the main heart of the attrition. We'll just hit the modify. Hey, the map graphics to this one don't feel Napoleonic to me. Um, I think it's these big red lines, to tell you the truth. I think they're the main thing. But the little dots as well. It reminds me very much of the World War III games that SPI in particular was putting out in the late 70s. And it uses that same kind of uh, graphic style. And it kind of weirds me out. It's pretty enough, but, and functional, but anyway. All right, what's special in attrition? Well, first of all, if you have a, a, a star, you get a minus one bonus. Um, you have to distribute the losses equally or evenly among the leaders in the force. Uh, one commander, then each subordinate takes a loss. French Guards, they do not take attrition losses and you don't count their forces. If you get an attrition result that says prohibited, one of these dark dots, then you have to move to the first number that is not prohibited. Take all those losses and you don't get to go as far as you thought you did. Uh, Austrian Landwehr strength point markers have north and south Danube. Now these are actually, I think, by color yeah. on the counters. Most of the force colors don't matter much. These do, and the guard do. Oh. The entire north side of the Danube, outside Bavaria, is the home of the North Danube. Yeah, yeah. If Vienna morale is a negative mo number, and the third city of a landwehr contingent's home province is occupied by the French, they take a special landwehr attrition, and each strength point marker of the affected contingent is reduced by 75%. If morale is zero, um, all are reduced by 50%. So there's a reason, perhaps, to try to time when you take the third city. This can happen once per game for each contingent. And O'Reilly, who's the Vienna land where the Shaw, is unaffected. All right. Controlling hexes. Uh, in general, the six hexes adjacent to a force are in a zone of control. But doesn't go across on bridge primary rivers. Um, infantry major generals cannot be created in an enemy controlled hex. Dispatch distances and lines of communication cannot be traced. And this was kind of important because this unit here is tracing down through these woods and then through the road to get to here. It is just in range. This unit is not in range. I had a choice of where to put the center of operation. Um, I feel like I'm going to be giving ground, so <laughs> I've planned for that, reasonable or not. Um, if you're in the enemy-controlled hex at the beginning of a battle segment, you're considered engaged and you will have to fight. If you retreat into an enemy-controlled hex, you'll take double losses from pursuit. If you enter an enemy-controlled hex during friendly march, you have to stop movement. If you begin initiative or reaction march, you're allowed to leave the hex for two additional movement points. Uh, if you're in an enemy-controlled hex and you don't have forces, the leader, the unemployed leader is eliminated. Forces just have to be in the hex. Friendly center of operation is displaced five hexes if it's in an enemy-controlled hex. Uh, and I believe this inactivates it. Uh, bridged major river hex sides. Zones uh, go across them, but you need not attack. Fortified towns. Zones go in and out of them. But if you're in the hex, you do not have to attack. And you do not have to participate in a battle. A force with only one strength point does not 
uh, force additional expenditure of movement points. And a force of only two strength points only requires one. I guess this has to be announced when you start activating the force, which might give you a chance to push them aside. An exclusively cav force uh, pays an extra movement point to exit an enemy controlled hex only if there's enemy cavalry in the controlling hex. Um, normally it's two, so I think no matter what, cav can get away easier. I'm not sure. The concept of resistance. When you attempt to leave an enemy controlled hex, any in, you can't do this by dispatch distance, because by uh, not dispatch distance, but by command movement, because you can't trace into a space, and that's why this is kind of unimportant. You can't trace into a space that is in an enemy zone of control. So the only way you can leave, and I forgot about this is to roll um, an initiative roll. And that initiative roll will be affected by this resistance. You compare the active leader's initiative to the passive leader's, the one that has you in the zone, initiative, and you'll get uh, a number that you subtract from the uh, uh, the number of uh, initiative the, the the initiative range that you're allowed to get in this will also affect pursuit and what it means is it's hard to get away in the rain and this is on all of them and it's kind of weird it's hard to get away in the rain <clears throat> but it's also hard to pursue after battle. Okay. During battle, I'm going to summary of the battle rules over there, and I never pay enough attention to these. Uh, every engaged force must fight uh, either as an attacking force or a flank. Well, must be involved either as an attacking or flanking force. Every hex containing an engaged non-phasing force must be attacked. Each force can only participate in one battle. Only engaged counters can participate in a battle and only against enemy counters with which they're engaged. Okay. Um, a pitched battle is if it goes to where the players switch sides. Remember what I said? The attacker can change. Yeah. Uh -huh. It can never be fought across a primary river hex side. You cannot pick pitched battle for a leader a greater number of times than his initiative writing. Flanking forces are in the battle, but they don't add their strength to the attack. They don't suffer strength point losses, but they will retreat um, if forced to. They cannot be pursued, nor are they allowed to pursue. Okay, so if a battle makes its way, and we can look at this, you define your force, you indicate which hex you're attacking, you secretly select a battle chip, a pitched or pursuit. You do artillery fire, you then uh, resolve the combat result. The winning side takes strength point losses, the losing side reveals his chip, and then he either takes casualties if he did a pitched battle, or if he did a pursuit, he runs away, which can also cause casualties. Um, if we make it past there, the side switch, the non-phasing player defines his counterattack, the phasing, the non-phasing player uh, indicates which hex, is, which hex he's attacking, uh, which doesn't have to be all of them. Uh, he does artillery, etc. And you just keep going. The results of the battle come off of here. You get a ratio, and not counting the artillery, and you get an attacker, defender, casualty costs. In each combat round, 
the attacker and the defender will be rolling on here to see uh, whether they cause casualties with their artillery. The artillery just gets a roll, sees whether or not it does the damage. Okay. We have modifiers here. Um, interestingly, I do not see The shaded thing indicates which side has to retreat, right? The defender is the retreating force when it's unshaded, the casualty, the attacker is the retreating force in the shaded area. Um, uh, I don't remember what I'm trying to think of. I had something to say. Okay. Uh, casualties are distributed like with attrition, first off the commander, then off each subordinate leader, one at a time, going around. Okay, if the losing player has to retreat, he has to retreat that many hexes, and the path of retreat has certain limitations on it, um, and I assume that they are in an order. Uh, it must go the full number of hexes. It cannot retreat into a hex twice. These all seem like prohibitions. It must be the path that will cost the fewest movement points. It must go through hexes vacant and friendly forces. It must avoid enemy controlled forces. And it must go towards the nearest designated supply source. What's not clear is any precedence among these. Like I said, I think they're in order, but I'm not positive. If you have to retreat into a space occupied by a friendly force, friendly force is displaced. Um, I believe if there's no way that, yeah, that you can displace a counter, uh, it would eliminate the original retreating force. A counter in an enemy controlled hex cannot be displaced. Okay. Retreat off map. If you're forced to retreat off map, you have retreated your full requirement and you can come back on as a reinforcement. Okay. If the force that wins the battle is eligible to pursue, no, the force that wins the battle is eligible to pursue a retreating force. It refers to the resistance matrix to determine the resistance modification. I don't remember how that worked. In comparison of the initiatives to get a, a penalty number. And then you go to the pursuit table and you add a die for resistance. You look at how far the retreating force retreated and you see how many hexes you get to chase. <coughs> um, um, you're allowed to pass through enemy controlled hexes without effect. If the pursuing force is able to pursue into the hex in which the retreating force ended its retreat, you eliminate the entire retreating force. You cannot, re you cannot advance any further than that. It's optional. You cannot pursue further than you would eliminate the enemy force. So if your pursuit's long enough to cause enough casualties to the enemy, you would only go as far as you actually managed to chase him while he still existed. Uh, Major General, Infantry Major General can't pursue. Then we have to do that at a zero. Initiative. No. Uh, a <laughs> okay. If you pursue and step on part of a multi hex force, you destroy that, you stop, and then normal losses are assessed to the remainder. If the retreating force exits the map, the pursuing player can either stop at the map edge 
in which case he pursued the full distance specified for casualties, or he can go off map um, if he has enough strength points in the pursuit force to equal the retreating force. If he does this, both forces are out of the game. I don't think any casualties are actually taken then, though, no, so I don't know. Um, in any battle in which the defender's hex is a mountain, wooded hill, hill, or fortified town, it'll use the... Yeah, this is kind of a weird place for this, but it'll use the affecting terrain marker, and this is where terrain comes into play. There are also terrains that have other effects on combat. Uh, so for example this, a maximum of three infantry strength points can be used to attack from a force occupying a mountain hex. And cavalry are sometimes weakened, etc. We'll worry about that later. We're almost done. I didn't think we'd do that. Each of the supply source hexes has an intrinsic garrison of one strength point. It can't attack. It does have a zone of control. Um, it counts towards stacking. If attacked while nothing's in the hex and has to retreat or lose a strength point, it's considered permanently eliminated. I can never take more than... A force attacking a garrison alone can never take more than one strength point. Now, we haven't really hit how these casualties are done in a pursuit. And I know what they are. There we go. The final result on the pursuit table is equal to the casualty received by the losing force. To, um, okay. After referring, the winner takes his losses. The pursuit procedure is followed. Uh, the losing force loses the number of strength points if the final result on the pursuit table is equal to the casualty result received by the losing force. The losing force loses that many strength points, <coughs> i.e. if you pursue the full distance. If the result is less than the casualty result received by the losing force, the losing force loses however many hexes the pursuing force actually pursues. If the winning player does not pursue at all, the retreating force deducts a number of strength points equal to the winning force's casualty result. Now, I amend these a little bit. So, like, if you pursue one hex, that doesn't reduce the losses to one. You still get that minimum result. Um, is that reasonable? I don't know, you know. I don't feel like these rules are nailed down all that well, so... Right, so let's go back to the garrison, yeah. Um, nothing too exciting. Vienna morale, we talked about this. Critical battle is a pitched battle, i.e. one side had to pick pitched once, in which either side loses seven or more strength points. That'll be a critical battle. Um, whoever doesn't retreat subtracts the retreating player's strength point losses from his own. If the difference is at least two, he rolls a die, and... If he gets under that difference, then he can adjust the morale marker one space in his favor. Okay, the dis the, that's positive too. <laughs> um, the conditional reinforcements on the Austrian include some Viennese citizens. This, this O'Reilly shows up there. The instant Vienna morale reaches plus two. Saxons cannot march, although they can defend normally, so there are some rules on them. Once it reaches plus three, this affects Württemberg and Bavaria. During April and May, all of the Bavarian army must remain in the Bavarian territory south of the Danube. Uh, after the 31st of May, if I can remember this, the one-third of the Bavarian army strength points have to remain south of the Danube behind the Tron, and a third can go anywhere, and a third have to remain as before. Bridges. Whenever there's a road across a river, that's got a permanent bridge. If it's a primary river, it's a primary permanent bridge. 
If it's a secondary river, it's a secondary. These can be damaged and repaired, but never destroyed. A trestle is a bridge that can be built by players, and that's these things, in order to cross uh, rivers. There's primary and secondary according to the river they cross. Trestles also are single and double span. Trestles crossing primary rivers can be damaged and repaired once built, but they cannot be destroyed. Secondary river trestles can be destroyed, <coughs> but not damaged or repaired. Now, one of the things is this, which is usually not rules, sometimes seems to contain more important stuff than it usually does in victory game stuff. Pontoons can cross uh, any river, including the Danube, across a non-bridging hex side. A pontoon travels with a force, i.e. he's got one, um, and you can deploy it. Now, let's look at these. The trestle. Any force can build a trestle, and it takes a number of turns listed on the bridging summary. Um, so, like, this will take six turns to primary single span. Primary double span will take four additional turns. Um, I don't know what this shit is. <laughs> Pontoons um, are assigned in the scenarios. You carry them around. Uh, it can be used as soon as it's deployed, i.e. another force can walk right across it as you're dropping it. Think the same force can walk across as it's dropping it. Um, to remove a pontoon, a friendly leader has to occupy the pontoon's hex, and then he can pick it up and haul it around with him. I'm going to need to swap batteries yet again. Uh, secondary trestles can be destroyed. Uh, primary trestles and permanent bridges can be damaged. Requirements are identical to destruction, which is we refer to the bridge table. There's a die roll, and I don't know what that. If an enemy force occupies any hex adjacent to the trestle, one is added to the die roll. What die? This is the bridge summary. Maybe there's another table. <laughs> I don't think so. Shit. All right. So I don't know how the hell you do this. So you roll a die based on the type of bridge, and you either destroy it or not. Um, pontoons. Uh, if you enter a hex containing a friendly pontoon, you can pick it up. If you enter one, yeah. If you're an enemy and you enter a friendly one, you turn it over, and then you can pick it up. <laughs> Only damaged permanent bridges and primary trestles can be repaired. Um, this is done by the bridge table, so a die roll there. Bridge summary indicates how much traffic can pass across it, which is the capacity here. But that doesn't count retreats, so you don't get screwed by like being forced retreating across something, which is a little weird. Um, you can have multiple bridges across a given hex side. I think these are bridging markers. Yeah. So the Danube, you can't bridge in general, but where there are little arrows, you can build bridges across those hex sides. Redoubts. If you have a strength point of artillery, 
And now, a redoubt occupied by a, a force containing at least one strong point of artillery negates enemy zones and controls in the redoubt. Um, a redoubt is removed when there are no friendly forces there. You can build it. You need at least 12 strong points, and you remain in the hex for six consecutive game turns. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Okay. Uh, your reinforcements... Some of them show up on specific hexes and you move them onto the maps. Others are the replacement points. Pressburg reinforcements. Austrian Pressburg become available on the 24th or 25th of June. The French on the 28th and 29th of June. Okay, let's find these. Twenty-fourth and twenty-fifth is the Pressburg. Twenty-eighth and twenty-ninth. But <laughs> it's not that simple, which is why there's a wall here. Um, they can be brought in any time after they become available. The first person who brings them on can only bring them on on the side of the Danube he controls. The second player can then enter them on either side of the Danube. If you control both banks, the Pressburg reinforcements of the other side cannot be delayed, but enter immediately on the nearest road hex free of enemies under control in the direction of their center of operations. How does this all mean? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> you have to control E1607 for the North Bank and E1610 for the South Bank. This is E over here. I thought this was the edge of E. Here it is. Okay. That's one six oh seven. I don't think that's that's one six ten. I don't know if that's right. But that's what they got written. Alright, there are some optional rules. Intelligence. Uh, where a leader's identity isn't known. Uh, formation in unit mode. Yeah, extended or concentrated. We're not going to play with any of these. I have enough trouble with this. But the extended allows you to avoid, uh, to take less attrition losses. Um, but you're weaker in combat. Attack effectiveness. Each time a force is... Uh, a fatigued strength point marker. What the fuck is that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, this the formation in unit mode has to do not with attrition, but with fatigue. And your attack capability goes down. You can bid for who's the first player. Dispatch orders have to travel the map. And limitation to administrative point. So what the hell does the cadre level do? Don't remember. So let's see. Eh. I don't fucking know. Is there an index? Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, let me keep looking and see if I can find a rule for it. The attack effect this role. Now, you might say to yourself, geez, Enrico, don't you always play with the expanded rules and everything? You know, I think I've tried it. Um, honestly, I found that I like Zucker games kind of as pared down as possible. I don't want to deal with it. Um, so, it is one of the exceptions. Eh, hope I didn't just screw him. I don't think he's there. <laughs> Oops. All right. Well, we're definitely not going to be starting this tonight. Um, so maybe tomorrow. I have a lot of reticence towards this. The only reason this is getting played, lots of votes <laughs> at this particular time. Um, 
I'm always more excited about this until I start looking it over. And once I made the decision, hey, I'm going to read the rules or whatever, uh, I kind of committed myself to it. So I'm like, well, let's get it out of the way. But yeah, I've got a lot of support on the request list over at BGG. And I like to clear things off the request list. This is not as big as some of the things like Vietnam, <laughs> Pacific War. Uh, those are going to be bigger undertakings for me. So this seemed like a fair, fair uh, compromise. Anyway, let's send this up.